I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Morality is up for grabs, and, and religious foundations are being tossed out the window. Quite frankly, in this day and age, it is, it is rare to find people who know what, what they believe. And it is even more rare to find people who are willing to stand up for what they believe. Someone who is willing to stand up for their convictions. We're surrounded by politicians that change their positions on the whims of public opinion. We're surrounded by businessmen and women who compromise their convictions to make money. Even professing Christians in this day and age willingly lay aside their beliefs and values in order to get ahead. I hear from people all the time that say, Brian, you know what, it's just impossible. You can't live for Jesus out there in the business world, out there in the secular world. It's very difficult to stand up for what you believe. Is it really? Is that not what we have been called to do? Where are those in this day and age who stand up with conviction, Where are those who boldly and uncompromisingly hold fast to the foundations of the faith and biblical values? As the words of the song that we just heard declared, let our faith be more than anthems. Let our faith be more than just the songs that we sing. Church, if our faith is nothing more than on Sunday morning we come together and and we sing songs and we walk out of here feeling warm and fuzzy, if that's all our faith is, then it's worthless. It's not worth anything. What we need are people in this day and age who know what they believe and are willing to stand up for their beliefs. Today we begin a series on the Apostles' Creed. I realize that, that when I mention that, there's, there's different ways to respond. Some of you sit back and say, the Apostles' Creed, what in the world is that? I, I, I've never heard that before. You have no idea to what we are referring. Others of you were, were raised in different denominations in which the Apostles' Creed was quoted every single Sunday. Some of you, have, we've uh, kind of introduced this video the last few weeks, have actually, have actually quoted parts or all of the Apostles' Creed because you learned it as a child. The Apostles' Creed is found in the front of your bulletins today. Would you take that and, and look at that with me this morning? I want to take just a few moments and read it because this is the foundation of what we're going to be studying during the summer. Let me read it. You follow along. If you want to join in, feel free to do that. The Apostle Creed says this, I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, don't be confused by that, it's speaking of the universal church. I believe in the communion of the saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Take your Bibles with me today and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. While you're turning, let me just give you a few interesting facts about the Apostles' Creed. The creed that we just read together was written approximately 1,800 years ago. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? Yeah, it was written approximately 1,800 years ago. Some scholars believe that they can trace it all the way back to the year 120 A.D. It was found in print the very first time in the year 390 A.D. This is, this is an ancient document. It's an ancient coalition of the church's beliefs. Although it's called the Apostles' Creed, it was not written by the apostles. Now, admittedly, there is a tradition that states that, that each of the 12 apostles wrote one of the 12 points. And if you travel to uh, 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 a cathedral in Europe, you'll find a mosaic that has uh, one of the apostles' pictures beside the different point. Quite frankly, though, there is no evidence that this was written by the 12 apostles. It does, though, summarize the belief of the apostles and the New Testament church. We have in front of us today an ancient creed that tells us exactly what the early church believed. Now, we need to realize that creeds were a part of the early church. Part of that was because clear back in the early church, they didn't have books and computers and iPhones and iPads. And so the church learned succinct statements. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament that are creeds, there are creeds that the church was already stating that the Apostle Paul and others put in the New Testament. One of those is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 3. And, and so this is just another creed that the church together declared as a summary of its beliefs. This creed is brief. It only contains 113 words. Now, compare that with our declaration of faith. We have a declaration of faith in our congregation that contains 3,200 words. All right, this declaration is much more succinct. It's, it's more brief. Its brevity makes it easy for us to memorize and to be able to say this is what we believe. The Apostles' Creed is God-centered. By that I mean it's Trinitarian. You'll notice the first sentence talks about God the Father. The second sentence talks about God the Son. And, and later on it talks about God the Holy Spirit. This is God-centered. It, it points people to God. This creed is Bible-based as well. You see, this is not an independent document that is completely disconnected with Scripture. To the contrary, as we walk through each of these points this summer, you will see that every one of these declarations is firmly grounded in Scripture. And when the early church wrote this, they weren't supplanting Scripture. They were just trying in their own way to summarize in a succinct way. Here is a summary of what we believe something that we can declare as a church. So, so this morning we want to begin with that very first phrase. And I'd like to have you read it with me again because part of our goal is for us to memorize this as we go along. And so every week we're going to learn a different phrase and kind of add it to the previous phrase. And so let me read the first phrase and then we'll say it again. The first phrase is this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Would you say that with me this morning? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of of heaven and earth. Would you say it again? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That truth is clearly seen in our text that we're going to be studying this morning as well as various texts that we're going to see. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Verse 5. 1 Corinthians 8. 
Oh, excuse me, I almost started reading verse 9. 1 Corinthians 8, 5. There may be so-called gods, both in heaven and on earth. Now let me pause there for a second. Notice Paul says, so-called gods. I would remind you that Paul was addressing his comments to the believers in Corinth. A Corinth was a place where polytheism and idolatry were prevalent. We know that in Corinth, um, there was a temple to the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love. In Corinth, there was a temple to Poseidon. We've all heard or watched the movie The Poseidon Adventure, right? Well, the, the, the Corinthians worshipped a god named Poseidon, who was the god of the sea. The Corinthians worshipped Apollo, Hermes, Venus, and Isis. If you traveled to Corinth during Paul's time, you would have noticed that the Corinthians worshipped a multiplicity of gods. Paul Paul addresses that. In verse 5, once again, there may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth. And some people actually worship many gods and many lords. And before we read verse 6, let me just say this. Like Corinth, South Florida is a polytheistic community. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? South Florida worships many gods. Uh, If you were here last Sunday, you saw the video that our that our creative team did is they went out on the streets there at Young Circle and they went to Hollywood Beach and they interviewed people and asked them what they believed about God. And my oh my, did we receive a variety of answers. We only put a portion of them on the video. South Florida is a polytheistic community. Uh, Our community worships many gods. Now, like the Corinthians, We also have temples to those gods. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? I don't don't know of a a temple to the goddess Aphrodite or, or a temple to the goddess of Poseidon. What are you talking about? These gods have buildings. They do. Here's what they're called. Malls and sports stadiums. But we have our gods as well. Let's not be thinking, let's not be deceived into thinking that the world around us only worships the God of the Bible. That is not true. So in contrast to that, notice what Paul says in verse 6. But we know that there is only one God. Would you read that with me together? What a great phrase. We'll put it up on the screen. Read it with me. But we know there is only one God, the Father, who created everything, and we live for him. And there is only one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom God made everything, and through whom we have been given life. Would you pray with me today? Father, I pray that you would ignite a fire, a passion of beliefs in our heart. Father, it's so difficult in the society in which we live, in which stating that there's only one God is not politically correct. Saying that, that Jesus is the only way is not acceptable in many avenues and areas of our society. God, it is very easy for us as believers to buy into that. Lord, and if we don't buy into it, to fail to be willing to take a stand for what we believe. So Lord, as we look at this verse and others and as we Study this declaration in the days and weeks to come. I pray that you would create a conviction, an assurance in our mind and in our hearts as to what we believe. And I pray that that belief would not only just be intellectual assent, but Father, that that belief would gravitate to our hearts and it would change who we are 
it would change the way we live. I pray that all of us will be able to say with conviction, I believe. We believe. Teach us from your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three questions, and I'm going to ask three questions and try to answer three questions. The first question is this, what does it mean to believe? All right, it says there, I believe. Paul says, we know. Paul is saying, we believe. What does it mean to believe? The, the second thing that we want to say is, or ask is, in whom then should we believe? And the last thing is this, how should that belief affect an impact my life and yours. The first question is this, what does it mean to believe? Now, the word believe is a word that you and I use very, very frequently. If we, if we recorded our conversations during the day, I'd venture to say that you use the word believe very often, and I do too. For example, um, here's some ways that we use the word believe. We could say, I believe that my dad is stronger than your dad, right? Mark goes around saying that all the time. He just goes up to people all the time. So I believe my dad is stronger than yours, all right? Um, I could say, I believe that pizza is best eaten with sausage and not pepperoni. Uh, I could say that. I, I believe that. I could say, I believe that the Miami Heat are going to win the, the, the NBA championship. That was a cheap way to get an amen on a Sunday morning, was it not? Now, 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 follow me today. Those are, those are personal statements that are founded on my opinion, and they're not founded on empirical facts. On the other hand, though, if I say, I believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States, I am basing that belief not just on my inner convictions, but rather on the evidence of history. Now, you might be one of those conspiratory people that sit back and think, no, I don't believe George Washington ever existed. I believe it was a fabrication of the United States government, but we'll let you believe that. The rest of us believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. And we base that upon evidence, the evidence of history. Now, so when the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, for we know, when Paul says, this is what I believe, Paul is not speaking about a whimsical, unfounded belief. To the contrary, Paul states this, when he states, we know, he is speaking of a strong belief. He is speaking of a confidence in the facts. As you read Paul, you can sense, and wouldn't it be great if Paul could stand up in front of you today, and Paul could declare these facts, but as Paul says them, there is no wavering, there is no doubting on Paul's part, there is only a steadfast, concrete belief in the existence and in the person of God. We read those verses and we walk away saying, Paul believed, we know that Paul the most common word for faith or belief in the New Testament is the Greek word pistis. We'll put it up there. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. I always have a tendency to pronounce Greek words with a Spanish accent. I'm not exactly sure why. So if you're a Greek scholar here today and you want to correct my pronunciation, please feel free to do that. You have uh, the main word, then you have its derivative there. That, that verb, or one of those forms of that verb, is found 243 times in the New Testament. And, and that Greek word is most often translated as faith or belief. Now, now none of us read the New Testament in Greek, and so that's, that's Greek to us, right? No doubt about that. So, let me show you a couple of very common verses in which those two words are found. All right, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. That's this word for believe to have faith. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. The apostle Paul says it this way. He says, if you confess 
with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Exact same word. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Don't get confused because it's translated differently. Romans 10, 17. So faith, the word faith in Romans 10, 17 is the exact same Greek word. So faith, so belief comes from hearing, that is hearing God's news about Christ. That word is used over and over again throughout the New Testament that characterizes what is it or in who do we believe. Let me show you uh, another verse that will shed light this morning on what it means to believe. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. You might want to find these, uh, underline them, write some notes beside them. We'll put them up on the screen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, the writer of Hebrews says this way, faith, same word, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about things that we cannot see. Let me give you two additional thoughts that I didn't put in your notes, just to kind of summarize this verse. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Faith believes the impossible. That's a great truth. Faith believes the impossible. The impossible. Faith is the confidence that what we hoped for will actually happen. Faith not only believes the impossible, but faith sees the invisible. Why? Faith gives us the assurance of things we cannot see. On Monday, our friend Malcolm went home to be with the Lord. And although we miss him and And although selfishly we would have had Malcolm stay with us just a little longer, we believe with all of our hearts that Malcolm this morning is in the presence of Jesus. We've never seen heaven, but we believe it. We believe. We have faith in the invisible. It's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Now, such a declaration goes beyond intellectual knowledge. It goes beyond intellectual assent. Uh, It refers to an assurance. Uh, It refers to a, a conviction. It is a belief upon which you would stake your reputation. It's a belief upon which you would even stake your life. That's not all, though. Because, catch this, belief that does not produce change is not real belief. Let me say that again. Belief that does not produce change is not real belief. Some have described faith as a verb and not just as a noun. You see, knowledge resides in our head. Belief doesn't just reside in the head, but belief resides where? Belief resides in the hearts. That's why Paul says over and over again, if you believe where? Not just in your head, but if you believe where? In your heart, Paul says. What does that mean? You see, real belief provokes change in our life. You see, it's James, I think I mentioned this later on, but it's, but it's James that says it this way, faith without works is what? Dead. What is he saying? Real belief provokes a change in our life. Jesus talks about one day there's going to be many that's going to stand before him and say, Lord, we know who you are, why, why we believed in you. And Jesus says, in that day, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I don't know you. You see, belief is just not something that we we have in the head. It's not just information. It's not just facts that we have accumulated. Belief is a declaration of complete confidence. The second thing I wrote down is this. To believe is not only a declaration of complete confidence, 
But belief is a demonstration of complete confidence. That that truth is seen throughout the remainder of Hebrews chapter 11. In the first verse, the writer of Hebrews describes faith. In the remaining 40 verses, he illustrates faith. He gives us example after example of people who lived out their faith in spite of difficulties, in spite of trials, in spite of persecutions. For example, if you have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11, just walk with me just a few verses. In verse 4, he says this, it was by faith that Abel sacrificed to God. What happened? Abel's faith prompted him to act. Verse 5, it was by faith that Enoch didn't Died. You know the story of Enoch. Enoch was translated. God took him alive right into his presence. And God did that to Enoch through Enoch's faith. Verse 7. It was by faith that Noah built an ark. We could talk about others in Hebrews 11. It was faith that motivated Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and, and head out to a place that he didn't even know. God, where am I going? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. And by faith, Abraham just starts walking. Catch this this morning. Faith motivates us to move. Faith motivates us to act, to live according to what we believe. Here's an illustration. Years ago, when Vicky and I moved to uh, Querétaro, Mexico, we hadn't been there long. In fact, as a matter of fact, when we lived in Querétaro, Mexico, we were just learning the language. And so every once in a while, we left the protection of our house and went out to restaurants and different places. That was a terrifying experience because they'd give us the menu and we didn't know what was on the menu. And so at times you order something and you don't know what you're ordering. You loved restaurants that had pictures. You could just say, I want that right there. And we did that over. So we were at this restaurant. Um, it, it was a kind of a, a, a nice restaurant. And, and, and we had ordered our meal and we were waiting for our food to come. When all of a sudden, Vicki, remember this, all of a sudden an alarm starts going off. In the middle of the restaurant. I'm talking about a loud alarm. This is a brand new restaurant. It just opened. And all of a sudden, an alarm starts going off. And you kind of, when that happens, you kind of look around and you kind of figure out what's going, what's going to happen. Well, everybody believed the alarm because everybody got up as fast as they could and ran outside of that restaurant. Remember that, Vicki? Now, here's the thing we could have looked around and said, ah, that's nothing. I'm not moving. But when that alarm went off, we did what? We believed the alarm. And with everybody else, we ran as fast as we could outside of that restaurant. Our belief in the reality of the alarm caused us to do what? Caused us to move and move fast. Now, thankfully, it was a false alarm. And we were able to go back. Our food hadn't been served, so we were able to get hot food. Some people had to go back to cold food. Some people had already ate it eaten their food and skipped out without paying their bill. That's a different thing. But, but, uh, but uh, when we heard that alarm, we believed it was real, and it caused us to do what? It caused us to act. That's what we're saying this morning. Belief motivates us to do something. So, so belief is a, is a declaration of what we believe, and belief is a demonstration of what we believe if I only declare it, but I don't demonstrate it, is it real faith? James says it's not. Let me show you a second thing. The second question we ask is this In whom should you believe? Like our title today, you may quickly respond Brian, that's a no brainer. I got this one. I got this one. Why, I believe. In God. By the way, did anybody watch the cute little kid in the spelling bee this week that when they gave him his word, he said, I got it, I got it, I got it, and then didn't spell it correctly. Poor guy. Well, at times we hear a question and we're like, yeah, I got that one. Piece of cake. I got that one. Well, I know what the answer to that is. I believe in God. Is that a deep enough answer? As a matter of fact, if we went out and we asked just, you know, the world very simply that question, do you believe in God? No, uh, no, no qualifiers, no descriptions. Do you believe in God? Probably two-thirds of the world would say, yes, I believe in that statement. Yet they would not believe in the God of the Bible. 
And so when we say we believe in God, we must be clearer than that. We must distinguish the God of the Bible from Allah. Uh, We must distinguish the God of the Bible from the God of the Mormons. You see, the God of the Bible is distinct. The God of the Bible is unique. We must declare who is the God in whom we believe. Now Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, he says this, For we know that there is only one God. The Apostles' Creed says, I believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Let me give you three sub-points under that. First of all, you and I should believe in God the Father. When we say that, we're referring to the first person of the Trinity. In the beginning, God. When we say we believe in God, we first of all believe in God the Father. And we can go back and we can qualify that even more. Why, he is the father of Israel. He is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God, the Father that's mentioned in the Old Testament. The second is this. He is the father of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, when I did a study on the paternity of God, I expected to find that phrase mentioned more in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. But it's mentioned much more in the New Testament. Jesus himself refers to God as his Father 163 times. God is the Father of Jesus. In John 17 alone, Jesus refers to his Father, or to God as his Father, six times times in verse 1 and in verse 5 over and over again he says that and so when we say we believe in God the father we believe that he's the father of Israel he's the father of Jesus he is the God he is the father of all believers as your father he gives you life as your father he cares for you as your father he meets your needs as your father he protects you I want to say just a little bit more about that when I close in just a second. The third bullet point in your outline is this, or the second is you should believe that God is all-powerful. You and I should believe that God is all-powerful. The term used in the Apostles' Creed is the word almighty. By the way, that's not a word that they came up with. That's a, that's a Bible word. That, that word almighty is found seven times in the Old Testament. It's it's the Hebrew word, many of you have heard of this term, it's the Hebrew word El Shaddai, the all-powerful God. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. How How did the Lord describe himself to Abraham? He said, Abraham, I am El Shaddai, I am God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. Now that's significant because God was about to do a miracle in Abraham's life. And Abraham would need to have complete confidence in the all-powerfulness of God. Realize it was only four chapters later that God gives Abraham and Sarah a son in their old age, Isaac, and God does the impossible in Abraham and Sarah's life. God is the God of the impossible. He is God Almighty. Here's a great question that I ask myself and I ask you. How has God proved his almightiness in your life. Sometimes we sit back and we take that, okay, ho-hum, he's almighty, and we fail to realize that he demonstrates his almightiness, not just in the Old Testament, the life of Abraham and, and, and Moses and all of them, but he demonstrates his might and his power in your life and in mine. Because our faith at times has blinders on, we fail to realize what God is doing in our lives. You should believe that God is all-powerful. Do you believe that this morning? Think about the difficulties you're going through in your life. Do you believe that God has the power to work in your life? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing 
to trust him. The third thing is this, you should believe God is the creator of heaven and earth. That truth is clearly seen in the verse that we read in our text this morning. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul says this, but we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything. And so we must not only believe in his almightiness, but we must believe that he is the creator. Everything that we have, everything around us originates from him. He is the originator of absolutely everything. That truth is foundational for us. If if life began apart from God, if you and I were not created in God's image, if we simply pulled ourselves out of the water, And by mere effort and time evolved into who we are today. What need do we have for God? And by the way, that's a a part of the mindset behind that, that secular push. We don't need God. We can do everything ourselves. On the other hand, if I believe that God is the creator of everything in our world, then I must submit to his creating and his sustaining power. If I can take him out of creation, I can live my life on my own. But if I recognize him as the source of creation, then I recognize that I need him. You see, Paul says this. Paul says, in him all things subsist. What was that that old song? I'm I'm not sure whether it was a Christian song. We just to sing it. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole. Come on, sing it with me. David, you know it. Sing it with me. We got the whole world. All right. I mean, what does that mean? Everything. He is holding everything together. He not only creates it, but he holds it together. We believe that he's almighty. We believe that he is the creator of heaven and earth. We believe that. Now, let me ask a third question. What does belief in God mean for you? You see, my purpose today is not for us to walk out of here and all of us to be able to quote that phrase. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Check it off. We got it. Good. Let's move on. Now, that's not the purpose for us learning this and for us understanding this. You see, a deep conviction and an assurance of God will produce results in your life. Faith creates a supernatural chain reaction. James made reference to that in James 2, 19 and 20. James says, you say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now let's not misinterpret what James is saying. James is not saying that we're saved by good works. But James is saying that true faith will produce good works. Faith will motivate me to do something. It's not just that I believe, that belief changes me. Man, there's so many different results that I could have mentioned today. Let me give you two. What does faith accomplish? Two things. Such belief will cause you to trust in God's care. A, 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 a deep-founded belief in God will, will cause you to trust in his care. Two verses, you know them. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your hearts and don't depend on your own understanding. Now listen, why would you trust in somebody that was not almighty? Why would you trust in someone who was not the creator of the universe? You see, the fact that we trust in him goes back to what we believe. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. I love this verse. Give all of your worries and cares to God. Why? He cares for you. You see, if I really believe that God is my Father, if I really believe that He cares for me, that will cause me 
to trust him. I realize this morning that's tough for some of us. Some of us here today didn't have a father, a father figure that we could look up to. As a matter of fact, some of us here today maybe had dads that abused us, dads who didn't love us. And so when we think of the term father, we're like, we're almost repulsed by it. Why? That's what, that's not what I want to see in God. Hey, hey, let me just say today that God is not like your dad. However your dad was, God's better than your dad. I had a wonderful father that I love and I can't wait to see. And as great as my dad is, and as much as my dad has tried to live a godly life, my dad's not like God. God is so much greater. God is so much kinder. God is so much more compassionate. God, God, God desires to take care of me far more than my dad ever desired to take care of me. When I truly understand who and how God is, it causes me to trust in him. God, I might not know what's going on in my life, but I trust you. God, life doesn't make sense, but I trust you. I believe in who you are, and that causes me to trust in your care. You see, this morning, it doesn't matter what you're going through today. God loves and God cares for you. And God desires to demonstrate that to you. Let me show you a last thing. The last thing is this. Such a belief will change your life. You see, really believing who God is is transformational. I cannot stay the same. It changes me. Notice in, in verse 6 what Paul says, But we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything. And notice what he says, And we live for him. My belief in God motivates me to no longer live for myself. My belief in God motivates me to live for him. Why is that? Because I believe he's who he says he is. I believe he's God the Father, almighty, all-powerful, who cares for me. And that belief should cause me to live for him. If I really don't believe that, I can live for myself. But if that becomes foundational to me, it changes who I am. It changes the way I believe. I'm willing to cash in all of my chips. I'm willing to put it all on God because I believe in who he says he was and is. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe? Would you say with me one more time, I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. Would you say that? Let's say it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Now, next week we're going to look at the next phrase because that's important. Not only do we believe in God the Father, but we believe in Jesus Christ. And God the Father has determined that salvation is through his son, Jesus Christ. You're going to hear that in next week's message.